One of the things we often say in geology is that rocks tell a story and that by studying these rocks we can understand what has happened in the past. And by understanding the principles that gave rise to these rocks, we can also figure out what might happen in the future. This is no more appropriate than when we look at climate. And climate is no exception to this rule because hidden in the rocks are clues as to what the climate was like in the past and what it could be in the future. To understand these statements, I looked up a professor who first introduced me to geology many years ago. In fact, you can still find them searching for these clues among the rocks, in particular, among microfossils. Oh, hi, Mike. How you doing? Good, good. good to see you. This is a great place here. All right, Jerry, tell me a little bit about what you're doing here. Well, this, these rocks are marine rocks, and I'm a marine micropaleontologist. Uh, there are really four kinds of paleontology. There's vertebrate paleontology, studies vertebrates from fish to humans. There's um, invertebrate paleontology, clams, snails, ammonites, things like that. There's plants, paleobotany. And then there's micropaleontology, which is a big collection of small things. It's not a group like vertebrates or invertebrates. It's got lots of different kinds of organisms in there, from algae to single cell protozoa. And that's what we're sampling in these rocks. Okay, so we are in the uh, Berkeley Hills uh, with the university down at the bottom of these hills. And this is known as the Claremont Formation. It's a Miocene in age, 14 to 15 million years old, and it was deposited in a deep water basin offshore during that period of time. So we're interested in looking at the microfossils here, and they are of several types. Foraminifera, which are single-celled organisms with a calcareous shell, at least as fossils. Radiolarians, which are the same things, uh, another group of protozoa that have siliceous skeletons. That would be SiO2 plus some water molecules. And then diatoms and algae and coccolithophorids and other algae because this deep water basin was accumulating the plankton and things that lived on the bottom. So what we have here are some churdy rocks. In other words, these rocks are very hard and they were formed by the migration of silica from the diatoms and radiolarians most likely to form these beds and then in between are mud beds like right here and right here. This mud is much softer and those are the places where microfossils like foraminifera might be preserved and much easier to process than the uh, harder cherts. Okay, so you can see up here the differential weathering between the harder cherts and the mudstone. The mudstone has weathered completely out of that groove between two chert beds. And we see that happening down here as well in these Almost between the individual layers, too. Yeah. Yeah. And so in the cherts, if you take a hand lens, you can actually see that it's laminated. In other words, very fine bedding. And I have here an old hand lens, and I can take that and look at it. When we use a hand lens, we always hold the hand lens next to our eye and move the specimen back and forth. And when you do that, Sometimes you can see the impression of microfossils, and so that would indicate a good place to make a collection. And then we'd take that collection of rocks back to the lab and process it by <clears throat> disaggregating the rock. The chert will not do that, but the mud would. So what do you mean by disaggregating? What are you going to do? We're going to separate all the particles in, in the mud and then we'll sieve it over a screen and that screen will catch the microfossils 
and let the mud go down the sink. Okay. And then we dry that out and then pick the microfossils out and mount them on special slides. So before we can do very much with the fossils, we need to do that. So one of the uses of foraminifera is to date and tell the environment of these rocks or any other rock where they occur. And that means we usually collect samples along an entire outcrop. So along this outcrop, if we collected every five feet or so, or wherever we thought we saw an interesting change, we might end up with 50 or 100 samples. So what I want to know now is uh, a little bit about these foramps, what they are, uh, where they live, and just the general nature of them. Okay, foraminifera are single-celled microorganisms, protozoa or protists, we call them. Uh, just like an amoeba is a single-celled protist or protozoa. Foraminifera have a different kind of pseudopodia, that is the streaming parts of the cell that catch food or that eat and retrieve food to the foram. And these forams are mostly the size, size smaller than, let's say, this grain of sand. So that could be a bunch of foraminifera, you can see that they're quite small. Although some are really big. There's one that was just reported that's about, uh, let's see, about that big in cross the shell. And that's a single cell. The pyramids of Egypt, for example, are made of foraminifera called pneumulides. And if you know the origin of that word pneumulides, it means coins. And they are about the size of a quarter or bigger. And the Egyptian pyramids are made entirely of these pneumolytic uh, foraminiferal limestones. So the foraminifera live in all parts of the ocean, and these are all benthic foraminifera. Benthic means the bottom. So the forams, as I said, are they're about maybe 4,000, or some people have said 10,000, living species of foraminifera, only 45 or so are planktonic. But they are by far the most abundant foraminifera because they live in the surface of the oceans, everywhere in the ocean. And the oceans make up 71% of the Earth's surface. So this so, is why they're useful as fossils, yes. well, as indicators of the environment and all kinds of things. Yes, so, the, so these foraminifera, all of them, benthic or planktonic are very good indicators of the environment at the time they were alive. So if we take a careful look at this rock, for example, from the Claremont Formation right here, we can see layering in here. Each layer is a single time frame, and we could, if we wanted to, sample each one, and that would give us the data we need to analyze the foraminifera for temperature signals. How does that work? Well, there are two kinds of forams, ones that live on the bottom of the ocean and ones that live at the top as plankton. And each one records a different temperature because the water at the surface is warmer at all times than the water at the bottom of the ocean. So we might have water at the bottom near one degree centigrade today where it comes from the Antarctic and flows through the bottoms of all the world's oceans. And then in the tropics, it might be closer to 30 degrees. So we have a 30 degree vertical distribution of heat. And the animals and foraminifera that are in the plankton respond to that by migrating up and down during their reproductive cycles. 
So we work with the biology of these organisms to understand what they were doing millions of years ago. And from that, we can take an analysis of their calcium carbonate shells and look at the oxygen isotopes, that is, different uh, kinds of oxygen. And we know how oxygen isotopes are distributed in the world's oceans today. And by inference, we can judge what the temperatures were in the geological past at a, almost any time, certainly in the last 100 million years. Okay, so these, none of these extinction events killed everything off. If we look at uh, the pelagic foraminifera, those that lived in the water column, at the Cretaceous tertiary extinction that killed the dinosaurs, we see that they went extinct too. There were about 48 species, and all of them went extinct except for three. Three species made it through. And why did that happen? Well, if you look at their morphology, the ones that went extinct have adaptations that have been interpreted for vertical migration in the water column. And they migrate down to a certain level where they exchange gametes. So they're reproducing at a particular depth. Mm. If you just throw your gametes out there into the water column and you make them from all the protoplasm you have, you're not going to have very many if you're only a micron or two in size. So they have to specialize on finding a place where everybody goes to release their gametes and reproduce. Mm. And they do that, as do other groups, uh, by sensing the density of the water column and the temperature, but mostly density. And then there are those that are, that are adapted to homogeneous water columns, like you have around the poles today, where the temperature gradient might only be 10 or 8 degrees instead of the 30 degrees at the equator. And they just seem to make it through these extinction events. And that's true even for the minor extinction events, like we had in the eocene oligocene boundary, which had a um, sort of a minor extinction event. But you can see it in the fossil record because the, the fossil foraminifera that um, migrated to depth for reproduction declined in numbers of species. And those that were simpler, adapted to homogeneous water columns, made it through. So they radiated uh, over the next three or four million years into a whole new group of another 45 or 48 species that were entirely different than the kinds before that extinction event. Okay, so we've got climate change, which is sort of the topic of the day, and how does that relate to a lot of the fossil assemblages from this location or wherever you're collecting? Well, the geological record records climate in terms of the kinds of fossils, so that uh, in this section of rocks we see fossils that were more warm water than what we would see today. And so that tells us, uh, with a little geochemical analysis of the foraminifera, just about how cold or warm it was. So we can make a record running back uh, half a billion years, 500 million years, a little bit longer than that, and estimate or infer what the ocean temperatures would have been. And this, of course, provides inferences about what's happening on Earth today. Right. We know what happens with the marine biota in the ice ages, Pleistocene. We can see that during the warm periods of the ice ages, the so-called interglacials, we had more warm water species off California than we did when it was cooler uh, during the glacial periods. So we can build that record uh, in detail back to a, about 780,000 years. And it shows that the climate that we're moving into today has not been around since about three million years ago, at least. And it's getting warmer and warmer. And during the time that this Claremont formation was deposited, 15 to 14 million years ago, 
There was a warm peak then that was even more warm than anything we've seen so far. But we're headed in that direction. All the data show that. So when we look at that record going back 780,000 years, we can see that the temperatures have risen and they have declined. The rise that we see today is faster than anything we see in that fossil record. We'll say that one more time because it's so important. The rise in temperature is faster than anything we've seen in the fossil record. So what are we going to do about it? <laughs>